Our scripture reading for this morning is taken from the book of Matthew, chapter 18, verse 21 to 35. Then Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? No, not seven times, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his account to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, one of his debtors was brought in who owed him millions of dollars. He couldn't pay, so his master ordered that he be sold, along with his wife, his children, and everything he owned to pay the debt. But the man fell down before his master and begged him, Please, be patient with me, and I will pay it all. Then his master was filled with pity for him, and he released him and forgave him his debts. But when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. He grabbed him by the truth and demanded instant payment. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more time. Be patient with me, and I will pay it, he pleaded. But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had a man arrested and put in prison until the debts could be paid in full. When some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset. They went to the king and told him everything that had happened. Then the king called in the man he had forgiven and said, You evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servants, just as I had had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid his entire debt. That is what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your hearts. Amen. I love how um, Jesus uh, is so forward thinking that he's already talking and teaching about dollars, you know. <clears throat> Translations. Yeah. Does it help if we use the original word talents for you? No, I don't think so. So the, we'll explain talents and dollars just a little bit uh, today. But uh, if you don't know this, uh, for the next few months, we're going to be talking about uh, the parables, some of the parables that Jesus taught. Um, he is seen by most people as probably one of, if not the greatest, one of the greatest teachers in history. Um, a lot of people don't believe that Jesus is God's son or the Savior and all kinds of things, but they say he is a great great teacher. I mean, it's just amazing what he teaches and the way he teaches. And I hope that as you are able to look at this passage, in fact, we're going to look kind of at the whole of Matthew 18 and see how this parable just perfectly brings together all the themes that are talked about in this passage in, in an amazing way. Um, this chapter really starts with a question that the disciples have, and this is that Matthew puts it in a nice way. One of the other gospel writers doesn't put it in the nicest of ways. The disciples were actually arguing over who's the greatest, you know. But this, this passage has them coming to Jesus as, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, you know. And it ends with a parable about the kingdom of heaven. That's not a coincidence. This whole passes, this whole chapter has to do with the kingdom of heaven and, and the way things work and operate in that kingdom, or they should operate. And what happens when they don't? How should we handle that? It's incredibly instructive and helpful. But it deals with some really difficult themes, as we'll see, like judgment, you know, which we don't like to talk about. But as you hear the story, you can kind of go, yeah, but that seems right, though the way that the king handled that in light of the difficulties that he faced. So as, as we look at this passage, you'll see that, again, the, this starts out with who's the greatest in the kingdom? The disciples want to know. And Jesus says the, the one who is greatest in the kingdom is like a child. And he brings a child, and we don't know what age this is, but a, probably a very a fairly young child. And he says, you have to be like this. And I think we commentators think what Jesus is saying here is that the, a child is humble. 
A child isn't all that conscious of, of what their status is, what their title is, how high or low they are. They're just living life. And that's what we need to be as children. That's what it means to be in the kingdom, to be humbled and to not be status conscious. And it's interesting because Jesus goes on and says, they say, basically, who, who's the greatest? And Jesus says, you have to be like a child to get in. Do you see the difference? Jesus says, to get in, you have to be like this. Not this, this I mean, this is the greatest, but it's almost as if they will all be like this. There isn't a greater or lesser in the kingdom. It's not about who's ahead of who. It's not competition. I don't know. I guess we'll adjust to that, won't we? Because life here is all about competition in all kinds of different ways, but in the kingdom, it will not be like that. And so he talks about being like this little one runs throughout the whole of the passage. And the little ones are the people who are Jesus' disciples whose lives are transformed to live the values of the kingdom of heaven wherever they are and whatever they do. And it goes on in Matthew 18, it talks about those who harm these little ones, that that's really serious. When you harm or when you, you push a disciple away from the direction that God wants them to go, that's a serious situation. He basically says it, it'd be better if you had died before that happened, before you did that. That's how serious it is. He goes on and uses, I think, hyperbole to say it'd be better if your hand was going to cause you to sin to cut it off. If your eye, pluck it out. If your foot, cut it off and throw it away. Now, the good news is we don't know of any disciples that took their eyes out or cut their hands off, so I don't think they took this as a literal. But I think what, they, what Jesus is trying to say is Sin is serious. It's far more serious than you know. It has a far deeper impact on you and on other people than you can imagine. And we don't take it very seriously. I mean, when it happens to us, we do, but when we do it to others, less so. He's speaking about the seriousness of the way we treat other people and the way we are treated by other people. He gives very vivid images. And it goes on and talks about the lost sheep. What happens when one of these little ones gets lost? And he says, Jesus says, the the shepherd leaves the 99 on the hill and he goes after the one. and And when he finds this little one who gets lost, he rejoices because of the incredible value of one of Jesus' disciples, of one of his people. These people who live in the life of the kingdom of heaven, how valuable they are that he would leave to find and embrace them. And then it gets a little more practical in the middle of this passage. Not that these things aren't practical, but it it talks about if someone sins against you, what happens? What do you do? Because as we prepare, as we live as kingdom, as people who live out the values of the kingdom of heaven, this will happen to us. What do you do about it? It says go to them. And realize they're like lost sheep. You know, it's interesting that this follows right after the other passage. Go to them and seek to have them restored. It says, humbly point out their sin and try to win them back to God. And if they listen, if they don't listen, take a few others to watch you and to watch them and to make sure that you're really making an honest and open and sincere effort. It calls for a willingness to confess when we're wrong and to reconcile with the other person. Both of those go together. But sometimes, as we'll mention maybe later on at the end, sometimes we can't always reconcile with someone. Confession, we always are called to do, as we see in this passage. Granting forgiveness. We're always called to grant forgiveness. But sometimes reconciliation, for different reasons, sometimes people can be dead. And we can't actually be physically reconciled with them. But we can confess, we can forgive. It goes on and, and it talks about in this passage that this, this is for these people, the, the people that are, that are part of the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. You disciples, you little ones, you followers of Jesus, this is the way you're called to live. And, and obviously these are difficult things that are being raised here. And so Peter, you know, as Peter often does, asks a question. And he says, so Jesus, how often should we forgive someone who, who, who wrongs us, who sins against us? How often? And he says seven times. Now, it may sound uh, like Peter is being limited, but we think he's actually being generous, that the rabbi said three times, 
And the fourth time, throw them out. Forget about them. So Jesus is doubling it and adding just a little bit on. And it's interesting, Jesus' response is basically this. Forgiveness cannot be limited to frequency or quantity. How often or how much, forgiveness cannot be limited to that. And this must have been a shock to them. And if someone has ever sinned against you, and I'm sure they have, and if it's been grave, it's probably a shock to you as well. We cannot limit the frequency, how often, or how many times we forgive. And Jesus used this parable to try to explain why that's true. I want to take a moment and just pause and reflect on some of the challenging subjects Jesus has raised. He's talked about the, the character qualities of people who are in the kingdom of heaven, that they need to be humble, not competitive against each other, not trying to be higher or lower. He talks about judgment. Judgment is always hard. And we tend to not want to do it, right? We, we give it to judges to do, so we don't have to engage in it. And then we can complain about what they do. It's the way life works. But judgment is important. When we do what's wrong and we're corrected, it means that doing right matters. When we do what's wrong and it's never corrected, it means it doesn't matter, right? We're just using words. But it's hard for us. It talks about the damage to ourselves and to others when we rebel from God and following his ways or when we push someone away from trusting God and trusting something else. What happens to us and to other people? And it teaches us how to deal with these things. I mean, isn't that so helpful? Because so often we're lost. We don't know. It doesn't, it's so hard. But Matthew 18 tells us how do we deal with these? Doesn't mean it always will work out. But we know the way to deal with them. And it reminds us of the great value of each and every disciple. Because when someone sins against you, it's easy to devalue them. But God says they're part of the kingdom. Their value is high. They need to be sought after and, if possible, brought back. And that's true for you. And it's true for me. It's true for everyone. These are some of the hard topics. And I think in a lot of ways, our culture, we don't want to talk about these things. We don't actually like the way God and Jesus speak about these. We just don't. There's some really tough things in here about eternal punishment. We just don't really want to think about that. And I think what's interesting to me is that what happens, what I observe in me and what I observe in other people is this. The scriptures say God is the judge. And I end up judging the judge. <laughs> I end up, we end up putting ourselves and saying, oh God, that's not okay. You can't do that. That's just wrong. I don't know if I can believe in a God like that. And we're reactive as opposed to curious and questioning. What is it about these things and go deeper into the subjects and to understand so that we can be enlightened into how we should live as God's people. We'll read in one of the parables in a few weeks that um, the, the unjust, or the, uh, the servant that was, uh, you know, had done the, the wrong things and the master ends up firing. Uh, the master basically says, I'm going to fire you because I've heard from people that you, you do all kinds of things that are inappropriate. And it's really a shocking point in the parable because the servant never says you're wrong. I do the right things all the time. That's the shocking part. That's one of the shocking parts of the parable. He, he doesn't contest at all what the owner says. But he comes up with a plan. Hopefully that's a teaser for you. But it's really interesting because so often we are ones who are judging the judge as if that's our place. We're, we're telling the king what he can do and what he can't do and how he should do it. 
And no wonder we find it hard to embrace and to deal with the God who's really there when we're fighting with him as opposed to trying to learn from him. And it's not easy to learn from God. We're pretty limited. But he's pretty capable of teaching us. Well, let's get into this parable. Now that we have a little bit of a perspective and now we realize how hard these topics are for us to talk about and understand, I want you to see the beauty of the way Jesus puts this parable together in such a way that we can end up going, yeah, that's right. I mean, I don't know all the nuances and how we think, but that just makes sense. That's right. The parable helps us put these things together. Who is fit for the kingdom? Judgment forgiveness, and also this incredible expectation that we should be transformed by our experience with God, not staying the same as we were before. So I have a question for you, and I like to do every once in a while a little bit of audience participation, so this is it. So that means when I ask a question and I shut up, which is always hard, and you talk. Who's the central character of this parable? Who do you think? Take your time, but I'm going to take as much time as I want afterwards then, so, okay? Who's the central character of the parable, do you think? It's always important to understand this, to think about this. Who's central here? What's that? The servant. Okay, servant is an option, right? The, 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 yeah, the servant that um, is unforgiving, right? Yeah, yeah. Who, what other people think? The king. There's not a whole lot of options, right, except for those two. I mean, it's kind of like a, you know, flip the coin. Oh, shoot, I'm wrong. <laughs> um, actually, it's really interesting because from our perspective, I think Mary Louise is, is right. We look at the servant, right? Because why? Because that's our position, right? And we're worried about that guy. Why? He's us. But this parable is really about revealing the character of the king vis-a-vis -vis the experience of, of a servant, of someone like us. So, so uh, commentators would suggest that the, the, the core person that, that we're supposed to look about and think about here is the king, that he's at the center. And, and he is called, he's decided to settle his accounts with his servants. And so one man comes before him who, who owes him a, a lot of money. You know, as the NLT says, millions of dollars. Let me, let me tell you what this actually says. Um, he owes the king an equivalent of a year's wage for 200,000 people. A year's wage for 200,000 people. I don't know how many people come to Luxembourg to work each day, but let's say, just get, say it's 2,000. So Payne, a, he owes a year's wage for everyone who comes and works in Luxembourg f for one year. So that's just to give you a sense of how in debt this person is. It may raise the question, how can you get that in debt? It doesn't answer that question, but I have some thoughts, but I'm not going to share them with you. But you can ask me. And I'd be happy to share them, but there's not enough time and space for that. And so what happens when he comes, he, clearly there's no way that he can pay this back. So when he comes in and this is what's read out, and it's clear he can't, he can't pay it, the king does what any businessman might do, is I want to recoup as much of that money as I can. And in that time, in that day, one of the things that happened was they sold you. They sold your family. They sold all of your stuff, and they got as much as they could and said, that's your fault. Because you're in debt. You chose. You made choices to get in that much debt. Not my fault. That's your fault. And so that's what he proposes to do. And the man begs, pleads for mercy, that he'll give me time. I will pay it all back. And the shocking thing of this parable is that the king doesn't say, okay, I'll give you some more time. The shocking thing of this parable is the king knows there's no way you can pay this back. And in his mercy... And who he is and how he responds to people, he forgives a year's wage for 200,000 people at cost to himself. That's amazing. That's shocking. That's surprising. We wonder, you know, when he does this with the, the, the servant, is we, we, we're astounded at this moment. We realize that this king is exceedingly generous in his forgiveness for this debt. And I want to talk about forgiveness for just a second because I think sometimes we misunderstand forgiveness and it, it creates tensions and difficulties in our lives. But forgiveness, when we forgive someone of something, we pay twice. I don't know if you've thought about this. 
We pay once when we're offended by the person, when they hurt us, when they do something that's wrong against us. And we pay twice because we don't require anything back from them. Forgiveness is giving up the right to retaliate. Because it feels good, right? When you've done wrong to me and now I can even that out. You slap me, I slap you back. Old Testament, what law is, you know, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Jesus wipes that away. That's why it's so hard to forgive people is you have to pay twice for their offense. And you know what? It's incredibly unfair. And it's exactly the thing that God does to us through Jesus Christ. We offend him through our sin, through our rebellion, through our, the way we have hurt and harmed other people and harmed this world that he created and made and loves. And then he has to pay again by withholding judgment. And he does it because he's merciful and because he loves us and because he wants to restore us and not destroy us. That's who this king is. And so judgment in this parable comes by not settling the accounts. This person should have paid the price for their wrongdoing, for their their debts, but they didn't have to do that. He escapes an enormous and unpayable debt and should have felt freed from the burden of this. But it's funny, we don't really know why, but this servant didn't experience the incredible mercy and grace that they had received in this forgiveness of debt. And we know that because they leave the king's presence and they go out and they go out looking for, for one of, someone who owes them money and grabs them by the throat and says, pay me back now. And then we, we see a repeat of the parable. It's so interesting. We see it's, it's a mere image repeat. You know, be patient with me and I'll repay. And he says, no way. And he throws him in prison. This guy owes, the, the, so the, the first servant owed, you know, a year's wage for 200,000 people. This person owes a um, hundred days of wages. So in comparison, so much smaller, right? And yet he can't be merciful. He can't forgive. He's not been transformed. See, I think this is how it connects to the beginning of Matthew 18, is Jesus says, if you're going to enter the kingdom of heaven, you need to be transformed. And it'd be like this. And the problem with this servant is they had this experience of incredible grace and mercy and forgiveness, but they were not transformed by it. And so they acted in a way that did not reflect the reign of this king in this place, in this time. And so the servants saw this and they went off and they said to the king, what happened? He called the man back in and he said, you wicked servant, I forgave you so much. Couldn't you even forgive your servant just a little bit? And he goes back on his forgiveness of this person and he throws him in jail. It's a pretty shocking thing and I think you know, we might go, well, how can you do that? Well, he is the king, right, in the story. He's the king. The king can do stuff. The rules and the laws of the king are what governs that realm. You know, I'd like to speculate whether, you know, maybe he could have gotten out if he let the other guy out. I don't know. (laughs) You can play around with that if you want. Jesus doesn't tell us the rest of the story. He leaves it to hang there with us. The king is angry. He should be angry, shouldn't he? I think we struggle with God being angry, but I, is it really a good thing when terrible things happen and God goes, yeah, you know, it's just the way things are. We got, what's wrong with you, God? I mean, this is really bad. See, it, God does get angry. He should get angry. It's good that God gets angry. It's what he does with his anger that's different than us. He redeems through his anger. He 
brings justice through his anger. He does not destroy and wipe away needlessly because of his anger, like, like we do. Jesus says, this is how my heavenly father is. If you, he has forgiven you the enormity of your debt, Paul McMinnemy. Logan Dunn, add your name. He has forgiven you the enormity of your debt. But if you don't forgive your brother and sister from your heart, so that's not like just the words, but like deep down, then neither will your heavenly father forgive you. And this may seem like, well, this just can't be the case, but if you go back and look at the Lord's Prayer, which in many places is read every Sunday, it basically says the same thing. It says, Lord, forgive me in the same way and to the same degree that I forgive others. Why? Because that's what people who are fit for the kingdom of heaven do. Do we do it? (sighs) Why is it so hard? Because we've forgotten. Or we never knew. Or we never understand the enormity of our debt to God. And how freely he forgave it. And there was no way that we could repay it. That's why it's so hard. Because we forget. Now, it's important for me to say one more thing. And I'm running out of time. And I want to do it really briefly. Is there's a difference between forgiveness and reconciliation that I think oftentimes gets mixed up. And I hear this often. And it leads, I think, to a lot of pain in people's lives. Forgiveness is something we give to other people, whether they ask for it or want it or think they did wrong or not. They don't have to agree with you for you to forgive them. Reconciliation takes two people or how many ever people there are in that party that that experienced that and had that. And as Matthew says in this passage, I think it's Matthew 15 and 17, part of this is confession that I was wrong. That's how you win the person back into the community. And what you know you find typically when you engage in this is we're all wrong. We're all wrong. I love, I love the story of the man who said he had a fight with his wife and he said it was 95% her fault. He says the only problem was the 5% that started the fight. Oh yeah, that was mine. We're rarely innocent as we think we are. And so we give and we forgive and we confess and the relationship is restored. So as we think about trying to be people of the kingdom, living these values, we need to remember how much we've been forgiven and how much, therefore, we need to forgive and and our forgiveness that we grant is so small to what we have been forgiven of. And we have to remember that this experience of forgiveness of God is there to transform us, to change us in the way we think the way we live. The mercy and grace of God changes how we treat other people as well. Will we stray like sheep? Yes, we will. Sometimes we will. Will we need the help of those who we've offended to point that out and bring us back to so that we can live our lives in the midst of the kingdom of heaven? Absolutely. More often than we'd like, we will need that. But at the core of every disciple is a servant who has had the overwhelming and unpayable debt that they owe forgiven. And because of that, have been invited into this amazing and beautiful community where humility is at the core. Service. Searching to restore And the goal of being right with one another is central. Those are the people who are fit, Jesus says, for the kingdom. Let's be fit for the kingdom, right? I don't want to miss out. Do you? Let us live our lives in such a way that by the grace of God, we are fit for that kingdom of heaven. Would you bow your heads heads with me? Father, we give you thanks 
toward the challenging teaching of Jesus. And in one interesting story, he sums up all the things that he's just been talking about and allows us to go, that's right. Doesn't all make sense, but that's right. And it reminds us that your goal for us is not to be happy, but to be holy. To be transformed so that we are different. And through that, we will find true happiness, true contentment. Not needing to prove that we're right. Because we've been made right with you. Father, help each one of us in the place that we're at. Maybe we're all good and things are great right now, but someday we will be challenged by this reality. Help us be ready. Maybe we're in the middle of this. Father, help us have ears to hear, hearts to learn. Help us look inside before we look too hard outside. May you do that for the sake of your people and your kingdom and that we might be witnesses in this world to a different way of living. Empower us by your spirit in that way. In Jesus' name, amen.